All right, jumping right into chapter eight review part two. So here's where we get into the application problems. We get into the graphing. Um, so let's jump right into it. So we got one of these wind current problems. It, sometimes it's in the river, sometimes it's in the wind. But with a tailwind, so that means the wind is at our back. A plane flew so far, so many hours, blah, 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 blah. All right, you always want to set up a table. So the big thing to remember here is that distance equals rate times time. So I'm going to set up a table with a D, with an R, with a T, and I'm going to organize all of my stuff. So I strongly suggest you make this table when you do these. Um, we need to know with the wind, and we need to know against the wind. All right, well, what do we got here? Let's fill in what we know. Um, and remember, our rate of speed here, our rate of speed is going to be the jet plus or minus the wind, depending on our direction. So there's actually four numbers here. There's the distance, there's the time, there's the jet speed, there's the wind speed. Four different things we're trying to figure out. And we're probably not going to know two of them. And in some cases, we don't know three of them. And we handle those two cases differently. Um, so let's jump into the first one. So the jet plane flew 2,400 miles in four hours. So we flew 2,400 miles in four hours, but it required six hours to come back against the wind. Same distance. So it looks like we do not know the jet speed or the wind speed. All right, so I'm going to just leave this in here as jet plus wind because we're with it, and then the jet speed subtract the wind when we're fighting it. Now, a little key feature is, when only you have two unknowns, all right, two unknowns, you're gonna be able to just make a system of equations. And remember, it's distance equals rate times time. So it's distance equals the rate times the time. I'm going to put the time number first just because it looks a little bit easier to distribute. So I kind of did D equals T times R, but shouldn't matter. And then we have a 6 times J minus W. And let's go ahead and let's just distribute that. So 2400 equals 4J plus 4W. 2400 equals 6J minus 6W. Um, I need to get, I need to eliminate, so I need to get one of those uh, coefficients to be opposites. I'm going to focus here because one's already a positive, one's a negative. And I think if I multiply this row by 3 and this row by 2, we should be good to go. We're going to get a positive 12, negative 12. So let's do that. Multiply everybody by 3. So that's going to be 7200 is 12J plus 12 W. So I just multiply 3 by everybody. Going the other way, I got 4,800 equals 12J minus 12W. And now we're ready to eliminate. Now we can combine the equations. Um, I get 12,000 equals 24 jet. And then these two are gone. So when I solve that, I end up getting J equals 500, and that's the jet speed, so we're talking miles per hour. Um, now I can put this in any equation. It doesn't matter which one. I can put it in any equation I want. So I might just choose, hey there. Yeah, well, I'll just. All right, so I'm going to plug this in, and I take this 500, and I kind of jam it in right, I don't know, maybe right here. 4 times 500, well, that's 2,000. So 2,000 plus 4 times what will give me um, 2,400. So it looks like W is going to be 100. So W, wind speed is going to be 100 miles per hour. And you could plug that into the chart, and you could see if it works out. Um, so, you know, if I plug it in here, 500 plus 100, that would be 600. And 600 times 4, it equals... Um, 500 minus 100 would be 400, and 400 times 6 will be 2,400, and it looks like we are good to go. Everything checks out. 
Now, that is similar to the next problem. It looks, sounds the same. However, there's a little twist. So this is a canoeing upstream, downstream. So I'm going to get my little table rocked out. Boom, 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 boom. So it says a camper canoe is downstream. So we're going to go downstream, which is faster than upstream. Um, so, you know, I'm going to basically have my, my canoe, or my, I'll just call it a, I don't know, what should I call the canoe? Because I usually call the current sea. Um, I don't know. I'll call it a boat. So I'm going to have my boat plus or minus my current. All right? So, so those are the two things. Let me just define my variable here real quick. B is boat. C is the current. And let's fill in what we know. So we go downstream, paddle back upstream. The rate in still water is six miles per hour. So that is going to be my B, rate in still water. This is B. So I'm six. And I'm six. Um, we don't know the current. So this one's going to be downstream. We get to add the current. Upstream, we take it away. Uh, it takes her a total of three hours. So they don't give me each time separately. But I do know that the total is three hours. So we're going to call this time down. And it's going to be a different time up. And hopefully they give us a Yeah, the distance is 10 miles round trip. So that means everything total. So that means we have a five and we have a five. So right away I come look at this problem. I'm like, oh crap. I don't have a current, I don't have a time down, and I don't have a time up. So I have three unknowns. And whenever you have three unknowns, we're going to end up using a rational equation here. And what I know is I'm going to kind of use this part right here as my setup. Because I do know, I do know one thing though, that the time down plus the time up is three hours. Well, I can write an expression for time down and time up using D and R. You know, because distance equals rate times time, if I want to know the time, I just divide both sides by R. And it looks like time is D over R. So D over R. That'll be that time down. So D over R. And I'm going to add to that D over R. I don't know why I made that look like a B. It's a 6 for crying out loud. 6. And it equals 3. So it looks like I need to get a common denominator. So my common denominator is going to be 6 plus C, 6 minus C. So 6 plus C, 6 minus C. 6 plus C, 6 minus C. And I normally don't write these all out like this, but I'm trying to teach you a little something, something. But I usually do it a little bit faster. So now I'm going to cancel out what I got. So I got the B plus C and the B plus C. They're gone. Or the 6 plus C, I should say. Um, so when I multiply the top, I get 30 minus 5C. Well, over here, these are going to cancel. So I'm going to have 30 plus 5C. Then over here on the right, I don't really know yet, but I'm going to have 3 times, let's crank that out. That's 36 minus C squared. All right, so we still got some work to do. Uh, let's gather up some like terms. These go away. So I'm going to just have 60. And over here I'm going to have, what's that, 90 and 18, 108 minus C squared. So I'm going to add C squared to the other side. And I'm going to take away that 60. And I get C squared equals 48. And now we got to figure out what the heck is. Oh, this one can't be right. What did I do? Oh, this is my bad. I knew something was wrong because my, my boat was going to be going backwards. So this is minus 3C squared. I forgot to do the 3. So this is a 3C squared. 
So divide both sides by 3. Oh, man, life's looking better. And square root, square root. It looks like the current is 4. So I know what the current is now. It's 4. So current is 4. And when I go plug that 4 in, I get 10. So now we have an equation to solve. R times T equals D. So 5 equals 10T. So divide both sides by 10. It looks like my time is one half hour for downstream. Well, over here, when I put a 4 in there, this is 2. So I basically have my distance equals 2T. Divide both sides by 2, and I get 2.5 hours. And that comes out good because two and a half hours and a half hour add up to the three hours what they're supposed to. So we got all three unknowns. Current speed in miles per hour, time in hours, time in hours. We are money. All right, moving right along. Um, we have this worker type problem. Or actually, I think I skipped right by it. Where's the worker problem? All right, here we go. So a worker problem, these ones are pretty simple. Um, and they're kind of based off the, the equation that work equals rate times time. It's kind of like distance. Um, and when you actually solve for everybody's rate, you know, if I solve for R, you basically get how much work can they do in a certain amount of time. And we usually define work as like one job. Um, so one job per certain amount of time. So... Moral of the story is just, if you can remember this, you'll be in great shape. It's always one over the time together. And that's going to equal one over the time of all the separate pieces. You know, if there's three people, there's going to be three of these. If there's four people, there's going to be four of those. Whatever. Here there's only two. So it says it takes a new worker 90 minutes. So we have a new worker, and then we have the experienced worker. Um, so we know two out of these three. We just don't know the together. This, this is the part that we don't know. So I'm going to go 1 over x equals, well, 1 over the time it takes. We can do one job in 90 minutes for the new person. And then we can do one job in an hour, which is 60 minutes, for the other person. So it looks like my, my common denominator there, 90 60, those both go into 180, and then I have that X. So it looks like I have the 180X is what I need to clear everybody out by multiplying everybody by 180X. There, there's other ways to do this, but I think this is the most straightforward. So 180X divided by X is 180. 180X divided by 90 is 2X, and 180X divided by 60 is 3X. So I end up getting 5x equals 180. And divide both sides by 5. And that goes in there, what, 36? So it looks like it'll take 36 minutes if we put the two people together on their own mowers just buzzing around. They can knock it out in a little over a half hour. All right, using the parent function, describe the transformation, sketch a quick graph. So parent function for all of these is 1 over x. And the parent function basically does this. We have an asymptote right here. We have an asymptote right there. And our graph does a little something, something like this. Now, we can shift it up, down, left, right, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. But notice that these first two are in a form where they have a number on top of an x plus or minus and another number off to the side. So on this first one, it's just like 1 over x, except for we have this minus 4. And all that's going to do is shift our parent graph right four units. So when I sketch the new graph, I have this going on. I'm going to have an asymptote right here at positive 4. I have that asymptote 
And the graph, I still have the normal asymptote, you know, right here. And so the graph stays the same shape and everything. It just kind of comes over and, and cuts down. Um, now I could, if I wanted to, I could put zero in for x if I really wanted to, and that'd be negative one quarter. So I could figure out where the y-intercept is if I wanted to. It's like a negative a quarter. If I wanted to be a little bit accurate, but it really doesn't matter. It's, it's just a quick and dirty sketch. It's going to look something like that. And you could check it on Desmos. Now over here on the next one, the bottom looks like we're going to move right to but then this plus three means we're going to go up three. So that's going to shift things a little bit. That's going to shift. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. Let's get some things on here. Some tick marks. So let's let's get our uh, let's get our asymptotes in the mix. So we have an asymptote right two. And we have an asymptote three up. And the graph that that one doesn't change the shape of anything. So we should basically look kind of very similar to the other ones here. And I could get, if I wanted to get some intercepts on this one, I could either look at my table or I could plug them in. Um, but if I find the y-intercept, if I let x equals zero, that's a negative one half plus three. So it looks like two and a half is going to be my y-intercept. So I cross right there. Now my x-intercept, I would have to solve and let y equal 0. So to find the x-intercept, i got to let y equal 0. So if I minus 3 from both sides, I get this. Uh, multiply both sides by x minus 2. Subtract 6 from both sides. And divide, divide, I get x equals 1 and 2 thirds. So 1 and 2 thirds, so we're crossing right in here. So now I have a nice little something, something that I can sketch. Remember those asymptotes just kind of affect the end behavior. They just keep approaching and don't quite ever get there, but they keep on trying. All right, so now we move into... Um, Another ones where these ones you do not have to graph. I just want you to identify the asymptotes, um, x and y intercepts. Show your algebra when finding these intercepts. So that's going to be, you're going to need to do that in the test. So let's first look at the asymptotes. Well, if this thing is shifted, remember this thing is shifted right one and then down three. So that's going to give me my two asymptotes right there. So it looks like I'm going to have a the bottom gives me the vertical asymptote. Vertical asymptote at x equals 1. A horizontal asymptote down 3. So that's at y equals negative 3. So there's two of the four pieces. Um, now we need our intercepts. So the y-intercept is easier. So for the y-intercept, we let x equal 0. So that's going to be y is... 2 over negative 1 minus 3. So that's a negative 2 minus 3 or negative 5. There's my y-intercept. Um, for our x-intercept, these are usually a little bit tougher. We need to let y equal 0. So we're going to have 0 equals 2 over x minus 1 minus 3. Add 3 to both sides times both sides by x minus 1. Solve. Divide. And there we go. There is my x-intercept. Go a little faster over here. Very similar. Vertical asymptote at x equals negative 2. Horizontal asymptote at y equals 1. 1, um, y-intercept, when I put 0 in for x, I get 3 halves plus 1, which is 2 and a half. So there's the y-intercept. For the x-intercept, um, I'm going to put 0 in. So 
of 0 equals 3 over x plus 2 plus 1. Subtract the 1 from both sides. Multiply both sides by x plus 2. Add the 2 to both sides. Distribute the negative 1 through. And there's the x-intercept. But no need to graph those. All right. So now, these are the different ones. These are the ones in our notes. This was 8.6. So these are the ones that we're kind of calling P of X over Q of X. So what you always want to try to do, this is kind of the order that I do things. And if you go back to the notes, and you go back to the 8.6 practice. So I'm not going to list out all the steps again. But first thing I do is, I look at this thing and I figure out, is it top or bottom heavy? Because I have a 2 here and a 1 here, we are top heavy. And if we are top heavy, then we know that this thing has no horizontal asymptotes. So horizontal asymptotes, none. All right, so that's my first thing I need. Um, then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to factor this thing out. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to factor this, and I'm going to get x times x plus 2 all over 3 times x plus 1. Well, nothing canceled. So for holes, I'm going to say none because nothing canceled. If something canceled out, then there's a hole there. Uh, but there's not, so I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, and now what the top and the bottom give me the... the zeros in the vertical asymptote. So my bottom, x cannot be negative 1, so that's my vertical asymptote. So x equals negative 1 is a vertical asymptote. Um, and then the top gives me the zeros. So I have two options for zeros on the top. It looks like uh, my zeros could be x equals 0 or x could be negative 2. So now i got to slap all this crap on the graph. So I come over here and put my asymptote in at x equals negative 1. Right there, we had no horizontal. Um, I do have zeros at 0 and negative 2. So let's kind of put a 0 in at 0 and at negative 2. Um, and now what you want to want to do is you're going to want to go to your TI. 84, which I'm not going to go through pulling that up. And you guys know how to graph it by now. Um, and I actually took a little more time when we did the practice. But on the test, you're going to have to use your TI-84, and you're going to have to get a few other points to kind of graph this thing and see what it looks like. Um, you could make your own little XY table and put it in there. But for the picture, I'm just going to ask you to look at the solutions for the graph. So C solutions for a graph. Otherwise it's going to take forever. All right, and you're only going to probably graph one to two of them on the test. I'm really interested in the key features, the other stuff. So this next one, I'm going to go a little faster. So we are bottom heavy. When you're bottom heavy, you have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. So I know we have an asymptote right there. All right, now I factor it. I'm like, okay, I have a negative 4, which goes to an x plus 2. On the bottom, that's an x plus 4, x plus 2. Beautiful. I got a cancellation. When you get a cancellation right there, so that means uh, things cancel at negative 2. So I'm going to have a hole at x equals negative 2. And now I go and I get my, my zeros and my vertical asymptote. Well, on the bottom, that's going to give me a VA at x equals negative 4. All right, so vertical asymptote at x equals negative 4. So I got that going on. And there's not going to be any x-intercepts because when I look at the top, there's nothing left up there. All right, the, the x plus 2 is gone. There's no x expression. 
So this has no x-intercept or no zero. So we don't cross that line uh, anywhere. So basically we're, we're going to just have our graph in there. And again, I'm just going to say C solutions if you want the picture. Because there will be a hole. There will be a hole, you know, somewhere. It's probably going to look something like that, but there's going to be a hole right there. You know, something of that nature. All right, two more. Let's wrap this up. Boom. So I look at this one. Well, if you're not top heavy, you're not bottom heavy, there is a tie. And when there's a tie, I look at the lead coefficients. So it looks like we have, at y equals negative 2, we have a horizontal asymptote. So y equals negative 2, horizontal asymptote. Um, let's keep on rolling. Let's factor this joker. So negative 2 gives me x squared minus 4x plus 3 all over. Let's go ahead and factor this out. That's an x minus 4, x minus 1. The top is still factorable. So let's get after that. That's a minus 3, minus 1. And on bottom, we have a minus 4, minus 1. So it looks like we have a cancel. We got a hole at x equals 1. Hole there. Um, vertical asymptote here. 0 here. So slap this on our graph. We have a vertical asymptote at 4. So I'm going to go here and put that in there. Boom. Vertical asymptote there. We do have a, a crosser. We do have a 0 at 3. Um, and if I wanted to, I could find the y-intercept. I could let x equal 0. Just let's do that. Let x equal 0. I get negative um, 6 divided by 4, negative 1 and a half. So it looks like I get another crosser right there. So something like that. That's what's going on. Um, but you can see graph for more details. And last but not least, we got this joker. So we're bottom heavy. When we are bottom heavy, we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. Hopefully you're starting to feel this by now. Um, if you do enough reps, you'll start to feel it. So I got horizontal asymptote there, and then I got factor. So I got 1 over, let's yank out a negative 2x, and that's going to be x plus 3. So no holes. Um, and I got vertical asymptotes on the bottom. I got a vertical asymptote at x equals 0 and at x equals negative 3. Oh, man. So I got 1 here. And I got one here. So we got some funky stuff going on. All right. Now we have no x-intercepts. All right. So no, no x-intercepts. And so if you want to, if you want to see what that graph looks like, go in the resources folder, see the graph. I'm trying to make this video a decent amount of time so it doesn't, doesn't eat up too much. Um, Heck, I might as well slap it into Desmos. Negative 2x squared minus 6x. Negative 2x squared minus 6x. So 1 over negative 2x squared minus 6x. And... I got to zoom way in. Not seeing a whole lot until I can get in there a little bit. All right, so there we go. Asymptote here, asymptote here. So you got a U on top and these two funky things on the bottom. But that's what you're looking at. All right, hopefully this video helps you out. See you.